This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship. Good morning. We welcome those of you that are here in the sanctuary, those of you that have joined us online. We're uh, excited to be here in the house of the Lord. My name is Jess. I'm one of the pastors here at Cup, and we're just glad to be here this morning. We have a few announcements to start out. We have an Enneagram workshop that we are participating in. It is at Christ Presbyterian Church. Rich Henderson, who I've heard just amazing things about his teaching on the Enneagram, is leading it. So this is a fantastic opportunity. It's from 3 to 6 on the 20th. That's a couple Saturdays from now. If you are interested, um, you can register through the connections or let's you know that you're interested in going. I know he's looking for a few more folks to participate, and it should be a great day of learning. If you are not familiar with the Enneagram, it's like all the characteristics of, the go- of God in a various sort of personality kind of test. Many of you know your numbers, I'm sure. I know people around here speak Enneagram language, so it's really fascinating. It's a way to look at your own personality, but also understand God better as well and how you relate to others. That same day, you can relate to others through a supper club outing. We have dinner, and so you can sign up if you are, um, you can, there's a QR code, or you can sign up online as well. We hope you'll join us. It's a good, it's a good way to get to know other covenant members. Another great way to get to know one another is uh, through our Acts study. So this month, we're focusing on the book of Acts, and that includes some small group studies for Those small group studies start this week, so you have plenty of time to sign up. There's a table out back of the worship center. There are evening sign-ups. There are Zoom sign-ups in person during the day, various days of the week. So come join in, and there's study guides back there as well. On the 21st, it's a big weekend, that weekend of the 20th. On the 21st, after worship, you can pick up a sub sandwich if you put your order in by the 17th. Those subs will be ready either after the 9 o'clock service or the 11 o'clock service. And lunch is all ready for you, and you can head out into your week. It's a fundraiser for the youth activities that are happening over the summer. So uh, sign up. You pay for your sandwiches the day you pick them up that Sunday and order by the 17th. If you have questions, Pastor Megan, or presumably any of the youth or their parents, and they can help as well. I love all the different ways that we have these announcements because it's a reminder of the ways that we are being the church, that we are having fellowship, that we're sharing meals together, and that we're just gathering together. And worship is another one of those ways where we can center ourselves in Christ's presence, where we can focus on God's word, and we can be the church. So let us take just a moment to center ourselves in God, to take a breath and enter fully into worship.
seated. Beloved, Jesus Christ is the love of God made flesh, the love that even death could not destroy, a love that calls us to new life, to say sorry, to turn back towards God and try again and try again. So trusting in God's grace, trusting in Christ's love, let us confess our sins together. God of resurrection, you call us to new life, and you don't even make it complicated. Love you, love others, but we make it complicated, oh God. We fill up our schedules and scoot you to the side. We build up walls against one another based on opinions and preferences, judgments and willful dislike. Forgive us, and with your ever-present grace, gently call us back to you and back to the meaningful life of love you offer. In the name of love embodied, Jesus Christ, amen. Friends, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, and we are so loved. As forgiven and loved people, how then shall we live? We will have no other gods before God. We will not worship idols or any false god. We shall keep God's name holy. We will honor the Sabbath as a day of holy rest. We will honor our fathers and our mothers. We will not kill. We will not commit adultery. We will not steal. We will not bear false witness against our neighbors. We will not covet our neighbors' things. And we remember the teachings of Jesus. We will love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And we will love our neighbors as ourselves. As forgiven and beloved people, let us greet one another in the name of peace. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let us greet our neighbors. While the children are coming forward to hear from Guy and Dr. Nick, just a special warm welcome to those of you that are visiting here today. If you stop by the visitor's desk, we have swag for you, so don't miss out on that. And uh, please take a minute to pass the friendship pads down the aisle and to sign in, check out who's on your pew, make sure to say hello and greet each other. Well, hey, congregation. Hey, children of God. Hey, uh, children up here, too. Hey, Guy. Hi, Dr. Nick. I am so excited to tell you in the congregation what I did this week. But this will be more fun. I want you to guess what I did this week. You it want... was the best. Okay, you want us to guess what you did this week. I expect we might need a little more of a clue. Can you at least give us a, a small hint? Hmm. 
well, what I did makes me a better puppet. Okay, so that's a little broad, but what he did makes him a little better, a better puppet. Okay, what do you think, Natalie, Theo? You got some ideas? Any guess? Read the Bible, okay. Should we get another clue, maybe? Was that what it was? Mm, I'll, I'll give you another clue. It was with other puppets. Okay, uh, made him better with other puppets. Well, any guesses? Okay, that's, that's, I mean, that's combining it pretty well there, yeah? I was going to say uh, did a puppet show, but probably that's even better there. Guy, what do you think? You're right. I made a sesame to learn about the Bible. You made a sesame? What's a sesame? Well, that's just what we call a group of puppets. A group of a puppets. A sesame. Isn't it great, Dr. Nick? I joined a puppet church group. Some of my old friends were there. We talked about children, sermons. It was so much fun. Well, I'm impressed you guys got it right. He formed a puppet church group. Okay, well, what, what prompted you to form a puppet church group? It was a Bible passage from today. After reading the Bible passage, it seemed like such a good idea, so I got some friends together. For our first group meeting, we talked about the Bible passage from today. Maybe we should tell the kids about the Bible passage. Oh, good thinking. So for their first meeting, they talked about the Bible passage from today. The Bible passage today is from Acts. So that's the second part of the Bible, the, the New Testament, when we're talking and learning about Jesus. And, and Peter was talking to a crowd. And Guy, why don't you tell them a little bit about, about this Bible passage? After Jesus died, Peter was teaching about Jesus. He said that Jesus showed them how to live the right way, things like loving others and helping the poor and sick. And do you know what the people did after they heard from Peter and the disciples? They got together and they helped each other and kept learning about Jesus. So that's what I did. Well, you know, Guy, that seems like a, a really good way to become a better puppet. And, and, you know, back at that time, people getting together, learning about Jesus, having a group. Like, wonderful. That, that seems like a great idea, a great thing to do this last weekend. You know what else is good? cool? The kids can join a group, too, because they can go to Kaleidoscope and learn about Jesus, just like the disciples can learn about Jesus. Well, that's a good thought. So the kids could go to Kaleidoscope. They can go to their Sunday school classes. So other ways, just like the church of old, we can do things that we learn from them, learning together, living together. Maybe we can, uh, you put that in our little ending prayer here. What do you think? Yeah? Okay, let's, let's put our uh, prayer hands together here, Guy. There we go. Nicely like that. Let's put our prayer hands and we can bow our heads. Dear Lord, please let us remember the importance of having groups of people together to learn to live, to love one another. Amen. Amen. And now, the Lord's Prayer. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks a lot, you two. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. A sesame. That's so great. I wonder, are we doing what God wants us to do? How can we grow in faith? How can we grow as a church? These are the kinds of questions that we think about in congregations. And of course, the ever present, are we? There are all sorts of ways that congregations can think about these things. Consultants, mission studies, in leadership teams, on session, at staff meetings. I realize I don't know all the ways that you as a congregation have asked these kinds of questions. Hi, my name is Jess, I'm new here. But I do know some of them. I know you did a mission study with your interim pastor before Pastor Charlie got here in 2012 and in it, you confirmed your 2007 mission statement. Claimed and humbled by God's grace, we are disciples, 
journeying in covenant with God and with one another. Anybody know this one by heart? It's, it's not short, but it is worth our review. Our disciple-forming community is called to worship and pray together to cultivate deep and nurturing reciprocal relationships to minister faithfully in our daily lives and to warmly welcome all into our fellowship as we seek a Christ-centered life. We cannot journey alone. We need one another. And so together with hearts, minds, and arms wide open, we reach out to others in love. You all have thought deeply about what it means to be the church. There was also a SWAT report, S-W-O-T, not like swatting a fly, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, that one might sound a little more familiar because it was only a couple years ago in 2022. And lately in session, we've also been taking a closer look at what it means to be the church. And what's next? Covenant is a thriving congregation, but we know that we have to keep focused and continue to deepen our fellowship and spiritual practices so that we can keep being a thriving congregation. So today we begin this new chapter at Covenant. We're going to delve head first into the Acts report. And before you get too worried that you're going to have to fill out a survey or read the latest and greatest 21st century church expert, the Acts report, as you've already figured out, is the Acts of the Apostles. The beauty of this new study is that we don't need a consultant because studying the early church reveals to us a model of what it means to be the church. You'll hear echoes of the mission statement I just read because you wrote it based on some parts of today's scripture passage in Acts. After Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to the disciples in Jerusalem, Jesus told them to stay in the city and that there they would experience the power of the Holy Spirit and experience it, they did. With the giant whoosh of fire rested on each of them, and they suddenly could speak in multiple languages. They each tell of God's deeds of power in their new found tongue. And the crowd outside hears them, each telling the story of Jesus in their own language. It's the story of Pentecost, and we hear it every year. And today, we pick up Acts with that birth of the church, that very day. Peter preaches that powerful sermon, revealing more fully God's plan in sending Jesus as the Messiah, this new way that God is at work in the world. And here's what happens next in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 47. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he and he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common, and they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts 
praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Thanks be to God for this word and that it is the vision we are given of the early church, no consultant needed. Like the early church, we too are called to devote ourselves to give our lives to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. Devote yourselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching was the word of God revealed in Scripture. Their rabbi, their teacher, was Jesus, and Jesus was steeped in the Hebrew Scriptures. Their teaching was also the witness of Jesus, what he taught, the stories he told, the healings, the miracles, the grace, and most importantly, his place as God's son in the world who died because of us, but was raised again from the dead. We have a record of these teachings and healings now written down in what we call the New Testament. So the apostles' teaching was, at its core, the Bible. What was given in the Hebrew scriptures, which we call the Old Testament, and all the things that Jesus very carefully taught them, and the story of Jesus and how we are called to live in community in what we now call the New Testament. And we are called to devote ourselves to Scripture. Devotion is the giving of your life to something, the giving of your time and your energy. Over Lent, there were a number of practices we were invited to give ourselves to. Practices like praying and simplifying our lives, unplugging, practicing humility. And all these practices led us to the Easter practice that Pastor Charlie preached about last week. Practicing resurrection practicing finding new life and joy out in the world. Even though Good Friday lingers around far more often than we would choose, Good Friday does not have the last word. A Christian walk of faith is a walk with vitality that involves devoting ourselves to the heart knowledge of Scripture. A few years ago, a study was published, a sobering number of statistics. And if I am to believe it, less than a third of you read any scripture at all on any regular basis. And frankly, I don't believe it. First, aren't we all reading scripture every day right now with the book of Acts? One chapter each day. At this point, hopefully you're in chapter 7. We've read about Pentecost and healings and arrests and that crazy story with Ananias and Sapphira. The invitation for the offering comes up after the sermon, so maybe don't hold back this week. And yesterday we read about Steve. Uh, yesterday we read about the early church deacons who were called to serve, a position that still exists in the church today, where deacons are caring for the congregation and providing fellowship. And today is the story of Stephen, the first person who died because of his faith in Jesus Christ and the Jesus movement. Reading through whole books as a congregation of the Bible, equipped with YouVerse, Pray As You Go, and daily prayer apps, the whole Bible right in our pockets, I can't imagine that we as a congregation fall in line with those statistics that only 30% of Christians, of church-attending Christians, read Scripture every day. After all, how can we know God if we don't know the very word God has given to us? One of the key ingredients to a growing and faithful church is right here in Acts devoting ourselves to the teaching of the apostles, the scriptures, the witness of Jesus, 
the reminders in God's word of how to live as a faithful community. We're trying to make it easy for you here. That chapter a day over the course of a month means you don't even have to think about what chapter or where you're supposed to read in the Bible. It's Acts, it's April, they both start with A, and what's the date today? That's the chapter I read. And we also have these small groups and discussion guides and book studies, and this is sort of your last chance today to jump into those. So there's a sign, there are sign-up sheets in all sorts of different times so that we can study scripture in the same acts-like setting, in those small groups, in homes, and at the church. Even, okay, so maybe this isn't very acts-like first church, but there's also a Zoom group that's meeting as well. So hopefully, if you've been thinking about that, this is your chance to jump in to one of those discussion groups. Admittedly, we've sort of been sold a bill of goods on the whole reading scripture thing that it's this laborious thing that we do every day, like it's some sort of homework assignment. It took me years of slogging through devotional, devotionals like it was one more thing to check off my to-do list. And some of those years involved long periods of drought where having one more thing on the to-do list was just not going to happen. But recently, in her weekly reflection, Ruth Haley Barton, founder of the Transforming Center near Chicago, articulated beautifully the invitation that we are given to Scripture. It's not just something that we read with our eyes but it opens our curiosity and imagination, opening ourselves to a deeper level of understanding and insight that grows out of and leads us into a deeper personal relationship with the one behind the text. And it is in that context of relational intimacy that real change takes place. Ruth reflects, our approach is driven like the longing of a lover. We read slowly so that we can savor each word and let its meaning sink in. And rather than rushing on to the next chapter so that we can complete the reading assignment, we stay in the place where God is speaking to us, contemplating its meaning for our life and for our relationships. Now that, that's an invitation to read scripture. Not an added homework assignment to your to-do list, but creating space for a deeper relationship with our very creator, savoring scripture. Not for what we can squeeze out of it, but for greater depth and love. In addition to this devotion to scripture and the teaching of the apostles, the earliest church devoted itself to koinonia. I promise I won't use Greek words very often, but this is a really good one. Koinonia, translated from the Greek, is, is like community, but it's like a big swirl of community and connection and love and participation and sharing. And the early church devoted themselves to building this kind of community. It's beyond simply hanging out. It's the kind of hanging out when you're working together for some sort of a purpose. Maybe service. Maybe in a small group discussion about acts. I'll, I'll ease up on that. <laughs> Maybe just deeper knowledge and support of one another and welcoming others to join in. Or maybe it's trivia with the young adults on a Wednesday night. Fellowship happens when friends also pray for one another. When people serve a meal together at Triangle or Press House. When the Children and Youth Committee works together to figure out how best to share the stories of Jesus with our kiddos. When we worship together in Bradfield Hall on Wednesday evenings in a more casual setting and have some intergenerational activity. When small groups share a meal and some reflections on faith. Anytime that we gather, 
as Christians with more purpose are deepening the koinonia, the fellowship. I see it already in just a few short months as one of your associate pastors that this congregation is that kind of community, one that has a deep sense of friendship, mutual care, and hospitality all woven in your life together. We also have number three devotion woven into us, the breaking of bread. Each first Sunday of the month, we gather here for something deeply theological, mystical, dare I say, magical. One of my favorite stories to tell confirmation and new member classes is the story of how Hocus Pocus came about. For hundreds of years, the Catholic Mass was said in Latin, regardless of the congregation's main language. And during the part of the communion, where the priest would declare over the bread, this is my body, there is an understanding in the Catholic Church that the actual bread or wafer becomes the body of Christ. The big theolo- I know there's some theological nerds in here, and the big word for this is called transubstantiation. That one substance transfers into an entirely different substance. That's not quite how we believe in the Presbyterian Church, but the words for it in Latin are hoc est corpus meum. It was the magical moment in the liturgy where the priest said the words, removed the cloth, and voila, instead of bread is the actual body of Christ. Hoc est corpus meum. You know, the hocus pocus. I googled it to see if that story from seminary has any truth to it, and it it does, sort of, hocus pocus. Without getting into the theology of all of it, whatever we believe happens in communion, here is God's presence. Breaking bread, being reminded that we are the body of Christ Christ's hands and feet, or simply sharing a meal together is beyond ordinary. It bonds us. It builds joy and support in us. And every time we gather around this table or any table, community is formed more deeply. That is pretty magical. In 2017, the hashtag eat together movement began. It was a campaign to get people to set down their cell phones now and then and share a meal together, neighbors with neighbors. And that ad that has so pointedly stayed with some of us, and I know some of you have seen it, is still available on YouTube. Nothing brings us together like eating together. The early church knew this. They had it modeled for them in hundreds of ways through Jesus himself, gathering for meals, sitting down with others in community, creating thousand people picnics, breaking bread so often in community. And we're living this out as a community as well. Through our fellowship time, our Wednesday dinners in Lent, first Wednesday potlucks when they're not snowed out in April, small groups, after church lunches. Here at Covenant, the invitation is always open. Join in. You are welcome. And finally, the early church devoted itself to prayer. Prayer is one of the core ways that we give space for God to be at work in us. Our best example of how to pray is Jesus himself. He poured out for the people around him, healing, listening, teaching, and then he slips away to spend some time with God, praying in gardens and on mountains and away from the crowds. Quiet time with God is restorative It refreshes our dry and dusty spirits. 
it renews us when we're spent. It's a very great gift that this congregation is supporting Pastor Charlie being on sabbatical, to have this five weeks of renewal, to spend that time with God and to rest and to be restored. Time with God in prayer is a time where we can also pour out gratitude and thanks, where we remember how blessed we are. We know how prayer supports others as well because we know what it's like to be prayed for. A pastor friend of mine is going through cancer treatments with her partner and she reflects, I think I have said this in worship every service all these years. People feel surrounded when we pray for them. And this time, it is certainly true for us. Prayer is a powerful reminder of our support for one another as a community. I know I've gotten through some challenging times only because other people have been praying for me. There's a quote in your bulletin from Dietrich Bonhoeffer from his book about what it means to be the community of God, life together. And the longer version of that is that a Christian fellowship lives and exists by the intercession of its members one to another or it collapses. I can no longer condemn or hate a person for whom I pray. No matter how much trouble they cause me, their face that before may have been strange and intolerable to me is transformed in intercession into the face of a sibling for whom Christ died, the face of a forgiven sinner. Prayer trans forms of faith community. Scripture, fellowship, breaking bread, prayer. Churches don't need consultants to give them a fancy formula or a long-winded strategic plan to help them be the church that God is calling them to be. It's right here in Acts. Those last few verses demonstrate the fruit that is born of this devotion day by day as they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. Day by day, the Lord added to their numbers those who experienced salvation. Committing ourselves to knowing the word of God deeply, creating community, breaking bread here at this table and others, and praying these things bear the fruit of gratitude, generosity, praise, the good will of others, something the church could use some work on right now, and growth. This is the new direction born of the Spirit and God's continued movement in the world. May we devote ourselves in the same way to these practices. May we bear the fruit of gratitude and generosity, of praise and growth for ourselves and for God. Amen. Friends, we give because we are abundantly blessed. We are given more than we need so we can give to those in need. We give joyfully and we give humbly 
knowing we are simply following the way Jesus gave himself to us. Friends, if you would like to give some money this week to the church, you can do so by scanning the QR code on the back of your bulletin or finding the Give button online on our website, or you can place your money in the offering lectern on your way out the door in the back. If you would like to give more of yourself through your time, through volunteering, I invite you to, of course, talk with Jess, Melissa, myself, but more importantly, talk to your friends in the pews. Talk to those sitting around you and ask them what they do. What brings them joy? What do they need this week? However we give of ourselves, let us give thanks for our offerings that we both give and that we, we receive this week and always. Amen. Friends, as we gather around this table, our Lord's table, we gather as our full selves with all of our joys and our concerns and our prayers for the day and for the week. And so friends, we have a few new folks to add to the prayer list this week. We're praying for Pam Nelson, who is the friend of Carol Phillips and Rod Rines. And we are also praying for Megalia, who is Sarah Joy Lovell's birth mom. Beloved, this is the table of our Lord. We do not get to choose who comes to this table because we are all guests around this table. Our Lord is the host, and we are happy to be with everyone at table. Come, enjoy this great feast hosted by our great God. Let us pray. Holy God, three in one, you spoke the world into being and breathed your own spirit into us. You have journeyed with us through famines, rescued us from oppression, and delivered us to freedom. Even when we forgot you, you never forgot us, calling us back through prophets and reminding us of your promises. Thank you for your faithfulness from generation to generation, and especially for your Son, Jesus Christ. He walks with us along the way, 
and makes our hearts burn with his teaching. He breaks bread with us and opens our eyes to see your grace. He anoints us with your healing and pours out your love with abandon. Thank you for this bread of life that Jesus blesses and shares. Thank you for this cup of salvation poured out for our forgiveness. By the power of your spirit, make these gifts a holy meal. Nourish us, restore us, equip us to do your will. Our hearts and hands are yours, O God, dedicated to your service an offering of praise. Keep us ever faithful that until that day when we will gather at your table in glory, celebrating with all of your children a feast of endless love. All honor and praise to you, holy God, three in one, now and forever. Amen. Friends, our Lord Jesus on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he blessed it, and he broke it, saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Every time you eat of this bread, do it in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after they had supped, he took the cup and said, this cup is the covenant, the promise in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread or drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would our servers come forward, please? You're invited to sing along at the beginning of distribution today. It is number 516 in the hymnal.
stand in body or spirit. this table, we are reminded that we are Christ's feet and Christ's hands. So go out into the world to be love in action for others. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God that will never let you go, and the communion, the koinonia, the community of the Holy Spirit, be with you and sustain you now and forevermore. Amen.